So we're about to get started, everybody. Uh, my name is Megan McDonough. I'm the Executive Director at Pioneer Valley Habitat for Humanity. And I'm very excited to have you all here. Um, you'll notice in the chat that Allison has um, made a comment in Spanish. Allison is our Spanish interpreter today. Um, if anyone needs help accessing the Spanish interpretation, if you could please put a comment in the chat now, that'd be great. Thank you. So has everyone um, been able to access the interpreter service who needs that service? All right, Allison, will you just type in the chat if you're all set? And then I've started recording this session so that we can um, post it online as well. Um, right now, the only part that's being recorded is the speakers. So all the attendees, um, you guys get to stay in the background. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce our speakers today. We have um, Kathy Caputo from People's Bank, a volunteer with the Family Selection Committee. Lionel Remain from CDAC, uh, also a volunteer with the Family Selection Committee. And my name is Megan McDonough. I'm the Executive Director at Pioneer Valley Habitat for Humanity. And Allison, I'm sorry I forget the name of the company you work for. Otherwise, I'd introduce that as well. Um, thank you for your interpretation services. Pioneer Valley Habitat for Humanity builds homes in Hampshire and Franklin counties for low income people. We keep our costs low by building simple homes as using as much volunteer labor and donated materials as possible, but it still costs money to build the homes. So we sell the homes to families who are in need of housing with an affordable mortgage. The main topic of today's information session is to explain how to purchase a Habitat home. We'll start by spending a few minutes describing our current project, but then we need to get into the information on applying and we'll answer additional questions at the end. There's also a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen that you can use to type in questions so that we'll be able to answer those later on in the session. So Lionel, I'm gonna hand it over to you to, to read, to start the next section of the presentation. All right, thank, thank you, Megan. Um, I will tell you a little bit about the project. Um, Pioneer Valley Habitat for Humanity will be building two three bedroom homes on Amherst Road in Pelham. The site is less than four miles from UMass Amherst and downtown Amherst but in a more suburban rural residential area. The nearest bus stop is approximately half a mile away. The homes are part of the Amherst Pelham Regional School District. The homes will be connected to the Amherst town water and sewer system. Each home will be built to energy star standards and heated with an air source heat pump. Um, both homes will be feature one and a half bath, three bedrooms, and an open living, kitchen, dining layout. Washer, dryer, hookups, and an option to, for a dishwasher will be provided. These modest homes will be approximately 1,000 to 13,000 square feet each. Uh, outdoor storage and an attached 
shed will be provided. Their homes will be built on a slab, so there will be no basement storage. There will also be no attic storage since the attic will be reserved for insulation. Uh, disabled persons are entitled to request a reasonable accommodation. One house will provide one story living easily adaptable for someone with mobility impairment. The building team at Habitat makes all construction decisions. We don't build custom homes, but we will make reasonable accommodation for someone with a disability. The maximum cost of the house will be $155,000. The final price in, in mortgage terms will be set to ensure that your monthly housing costs at closing do not, do not ex exceed, excuse me, 30% of your income at the time you buy the house. The house will be permanently restricted so you can't sell it for a bunch more than you bought it for. But you do gain equity by making your mortgage payments. Uh, the next section is what does it cost to be a homeowner with Habitat? If you become a homeowner, your monthly housing payments will include mortgage, principal and interest, real estate taxes, and homeowner insurance, which are typical for any homeowner. Your average Habitat monthly payment is between $700 and $1,200 per month. Your mortgage payments will be fixed, but taxes and insurance can go up over time. This monthly payment does not include the cost for water bills, snow removal, or home repairs. State housing subsidies cannot typically be used towards a Habitat mortgage. Uh, for example, Section 8 rental vouchers. If you have rental assistance, please talk with the agency providing the voucher to see if they have any program for using this subsidy towards a mortgage payment. And I will turn it over to you, Megan. I, I actually am gonna start the next section doing the, uh, what the selection criteria is. So Habitat for Humanity looks at three categories when reviewing applications to make the selection for their partner families. We look at the housing need, we look at income and ability to repay, and willingness to partner. So for the housing needs, we're looking to see um, inadequate housing, uh, could mean that your current housing has structural issues, problems with water, electrical, sewer, and or heating systems. It could be un unsafe or unhealthy living conditions. It could be an inadequate space for the number and sex of the members of your family. Or that your current housing costs are excessive in relationship to your income or that you can't afford. An excessive meaning more than 35% of your gross monthly income. We also have an asset limit. If you have assets over $75,000, you are not eligible. And you must be a first time home buyer. So the definition we use for is a lot broader than you think for a first time home buyer. Anyone who has not owned a home in the last three years is considered a first time home buyer, as are displaced homemakers. So please ask for clarification after the info session if you are worried about being disqualified because of this requirement. So we also look at the income and ability to repay. For repayment, you are buying a home from Habitat, so you must show an ability to repay a mortgage. We will also be asking you to apply for a mortgage from USDA after being accepted by Habitat into the program, and they will need similar information to show your ability to repay. 
ability to repay must be demonstrated in several ways. Or maybe it may be demonstrated in several ways. Do you make more money than the minimum income required for Habitat House? Do you have a history of making payments on time for rent and other obligations? This payment history will be seen on the required documents you provide Habitat when you submit your application. And we will go over the required documents in a few minutes. These documents and your application will re be reviewed by the Habitat Selection Committee and by USDA. Habitat sets income guidelines based on HUD medium income depending on family size. The minimum income is 29,000. The maximum income varies with family size. For a family of four, the maximum income is 51,250 $51, And incomes are on the flyer and in the application income guidelines are on the flyer and in the application packet. Credit reports will be pulled by Habitat for use in the selection process. A credit score is not the only thing taken into consideration when we are reviewing your ability to repay. If you have delinquencies or judgments on your credit report, it is okay. The committee is looking to see that you have worked with your creditors to pay back any judgments or that you have brought any previous delinquent accounts back to a current status. You can't have any current judgments or liens, but something in the past is okay. In general, you must wait two years after a bankruptcy and show good credit in the time since the bankruptcy was discharged. This can be waived if the bankruptcy was caused by an extraordinary circumstance, such as death or a natural disaster. We are also looking to make sure that you don't have so many debts that it would affect your ability to repay your mortgage. A criminal background check and sex offender registry check will also be done. Having a, a criminal record does not automatically disqualify you from selection. However, Habitat does reserve the right to disqualify someone for a relevant offense. If selected, you will be expected to make a down payment of $700, which will be paid to Habitat in seven monthly installments of $100. The first installment would be due a month after you have agreed to partner with Habitat or when construction begins, whichever is later. In addition to the $700 down payment, you will need to save up during construction to pay for your first year of homeowner's insurance before we sell you the house. This cost will vary depending on who you select for insurance, but it could be anywhere from 600 to $1,000. So plan to keep saving $100 a month after your down payment is complete. You may also choose to spend some money for appliances or other specified allowed upgrades. Habitat will pay reasonable closing costs for your mortgage for your mortgage. And so the third category we look at is your willingness to partner. If you are selected, you and your family become a partner with Habitat in building your home and will be asked to complete 250 hours of sweat equity. What is sweat equity? Each adult that will be living in the home must complete 250 hours of sweat equity up to a maximum of 500 hours. A vast majority of this sweat equity is actually you building your home with volunteers and contractors. If you are selected to partner with Habitat, you should expect that you will spend one to two days every week until your home is complete. Workdays are typically nine to 4 p.m or 12 to four on a Sunday. You need to average about five hours per week to co complete your 250 hours before the building is done. There will be some weeks when on, on site construction work is not available because subcontractors are on site 
like the electricians or the plumbers. So you need to plan ahead to do more than five hours a week some weeks. If you are disabled, we will work with you to modify the sweat equity requirements to match your abilities. Future homeowners must complete 16 hours of volunteer work with Habitat, which counts towards your sweat equity within the first two months of being selected. These 16 hours could be working on your future home or other Habitat projects. First, a first time home buyer class must be completed and these hours also count towards your sweat equity. Once you agree to partner with Habitat, you will be assigned a mentor that will work with you to plan your sweat equity hours and prep your home. You would also work with the, with the mentor to select certain features, fixtures in the home, as well as any upgrades. You will have a thousand dollar allowance for upgrades in certain areas of the home, such as purchasing appliances. Most often homeowners use this to buy a washer and dryer or a dishwasher, which are not otherwise included. The mentor will be your main point of contact for nine to 18 months that it takes to build your home and the first year after you are in your home. If selected, you will need to complete an agreement that you are willing to partner with Habitat by completing these requirements. And now I'll turn it back to Megan. Thanks, Kathy. So the application process starts by filling out an application and submitting required documentation. The application with the supporting documents must be received by Pioneer Valley Habitat by Friday, March 12th, 2021. Applications mailed to our PO box and postmarked by the 12th will also be accepted. I'm going to now bring up a copy of the application so that everyone can see it and follow along with me. The application form is available in Spanish and in English. The packet starts off with this um, colorful flyer showing uh, an overview about the project and encouraging people to attend an information session. The next page is blank and then there is a letter that it's a two page letter that outlines the steps in the application process. So if you forget something from today's information session, you can look on this letter for an overview of how the application process works. I recommend you read through the entire letter. The application form itself starts with asking you basic contact information. What is your name, social security number, your phone number? Um, do you have any dependents living in your house, any children or adult dependents? Then also it asks if you have a co-applicant. A co-applicant would be someone who plans to purchase the home with you and would, their name would go on the deed and they would be a co-borrower on your mortgage. If you have another adult in the house who's not going to be purchasing the house with you, you can list them as a dependent. One of the most important things about filling out the application is to do it completely. If there is a section of the application that you think doesn't apply to you, it's best if you write not applicable or none. So right here in co-applicant, if you're not applying with anyone, feel free to write no, none or NA. Um, that way we know you didn't just forget to fill it in, but that you, it's not applicable to you. Please fill in your current address. Tell us how long you've lived there and if you've lived there for less than two years, please give us your last address as well. At the bottom of the first page, there's a small section for the office to put in some important dates that you get to skip. Section three asks you about your willingness to partner. And I see that someone has raised their hand. 
Um, we're going to take questions at the end, unless you want to, if you want to put a question in the Q&A box right now, that would give us a chance to um, get back, make sure we don't forget to answer your question. If you see that Q&A box and are able to type it in there, that would be great. The um, section four, present housing conditions, is where we ask you about where you currently live. And um, I, I see the question in the Q&A and I'm just gonna answer it. So the question was, um, if you, someone, if, if you're, you have a partner who is employed but is maybe a stay at home parent caring for children, should they be listed as a co-applicant or a dependent? You don't have to be, have any income to be listed as a co-applicant. You just have to be someone who is going to share in the ownership of the house. So we want that anyone who's going to be a co-applicant be someone who's going to share the ownership of the house. Uh, getting back to the application here, section four, we ask you to tell us a little bit about your current housing conditions. That allows us to know, um, you know, if you have inadequate housing currently. Section five, sometimes people are surprised about this one. This says property information. This is asking if you own property. Do you own the house where you live right now? Do you own land somewhere else? This is really important to answer yes or no. Um, most people who are renting don't own property, but we just want you to click no if that's the case. And if you do, then this is an important disclosure to make. Oops, I'm going too fast there. Section six on the application is where we ask about employment information. If you are the applicant, list your current employer, co-applicant, Cur their current employer and the how much you earn there, how long you've been on the job. Section seven asks about other income beyond employment. The first line asks about your wages and then it asks things like TANF or welfare cash payments, alimony, child support, social security, disability or other sources of income. There's a column for the applicant for the co-applicant, and if there's others in the household who are not going to be applicant or co-applicant who have income, you wanna list that here. If you've listed others in the household that have income, please list their names underneath here so that we know who that uh, person is associated with that income source. Section eight, is the source of down payment and closing costs. How do you plan to make the down payment? It's $700 and can be made in installments of $100. So perhaps you're just going to budget for it with from your income, or maybe you have that saved already, or maybe you have a friend or family who will be gifting that to you. Section nine, assets. You need to list any bank accounts you have, checking the account, savings account, and what the current balance is. Also list other significant assets, if, you know, things worth more than $1,000, please list them here and state their value. Debt is what section 10 is focused on. Uh, do you owe money? We will be running a credit report and we'll see your debt there. And so this is just a helpful for us to make sure that we're all on the same page about um, where your debts are. Do you pay child support? This is because this is asking about debt. It's not whether you receive it. This is whether you pay child support or alimony. We're back in the income section when it asked about child support and alimony. We were asking if you received it. Do you have any credit card debt? What would be the minimum monthly payment? Section, this next section here asks you about your monthly expenses. And this is a good time for you to reflect on where your major uh, outlays of cash are each month to help you budget for the idea of home ownership. Section 11 declarations are yes and no questions. Please answer all the questions truthfully. 
and have your co-applicant answer as well if there are questions. Um, sometimes people get into a frenzy of answering no and then answer question I, are you a US citizen or permanent resident incorrectly? Because they got used to answering no to some of these other questions. So just take a careful look at all the questions and answer yes or no, depending on whatever pertains to you. If you answer, yes to questions A through H or no to question I, then you could just write a little explanation underneath the declaration, giving us some context. That would be very helpful. Then the next part you need to do is sign the application. So um, you and your co-applicant both need to sign the application, date it, and also acknowledge that you have the right to receive a copy of an appraisal before you buy the home. So you get another signature. Section 14 is about demographic information. So you can tell us a little bit about you so that um, we can report to government as needed. And it helps us to make sure that we are able to serve a wide variety of the community by understanding a little bit more about your demographics. You get to sign something again, you're not quite done signing. You need to read this Equal Credit Opportunity Act notice so that you understand that there is recourse for filing complaints if you believe that there was a problem with providing equal access to credit. So please sign that here. And then I'm gonna pause here for a minute because this is a really important section of the application and our interpreter needs to have a little bit of a break because she's been talking nonstop for the last half hour. So we're gonna take a, um, a quick five minute break for our interpreter and everyone can take a chance to read through what the required documents are for your application. I'll also answer some of the questions in the Q&A um, by typing while we're taking a talking break.
All right, we're going to get started again. And I'm sorry I didn't get to all the questions in the Q&A yet, but we will um, return to the Q&A questions um, after finishing going through the application. So attachment A here is the required documents that you must submit with your application. You need to get copies of your three most recent signed federal income tax returns. And I realize that today, most people won't have 2020 taxes, um, but the deadline to apply for this house is March 12th. So if you um, wait uh, a couple of weeks, maybe you can do your taxes early. I know Lionel could answer in the Q&A about there's tax assistance programs uh, available to help you do your taxes. We like copies of your W-2 forms or 1098s or 1099s, any other source of documentation for the most recent two tax years. A copy of your five most recent consecutive pay subs for all adult household members who are working. Or if someone in your, if there's adult in your household who's not working at all, then we need a, a written statement signed from them confirming that they have no income. So that's something that's easy to forget in your application, but please write us a letter or if you need a form to fill out, I can send you one, just a statement saying that you have no income. We need written proof of any other sources of income such as child support, alimony, social security, disability payments, unemployment payments, et cetera. If you receive child support, please include a copy of the fully executed court order or the separation agreement and divorce decree. We need copies of your last three bank statements, um, official looking ones uh, on bank letterhead, or if you don't have them, sometimes you can download them from online banking, or you can walk into a branch and ask uh, your bank to print out a copy of your statement on letterhead. We need documentation of all assets over $1,000 in value, the, whatever simplest, but this means if you have retirement accounts, if you own a business, cars, land, you need to document those significant assets, anything over $1,000 of value. After you've gathered the documentation, please sign this page as well, just confirming that you're submitting everything as accurately and completely as possible. One very important piece of this puzzle is we do not want original documents. Please do not send us your only copy of your tax return or anything like that. We only want copies of documents or electronic submission. And um, the next section about how to submit your documents, I'm actually, I think, going to turn it over to uh, Lionel to talk a little bit about what that process is in a minute. But first, I just wanted to review the income guidelines are right here in the application packet. There's a minimum income and a maximum income. The minimum income is part of us evaluating your ability to pay an affordable mortgage. So you need to have a gross monthly, excuse me, gross annual income of $29,000 a year or more to be eligible to buy this house. But because we also uh, sell homes to people who have a housing need, there is a maximum income. The maximum income varies with the number of people in your household. So if you have three people in your household, the maximum income is $46,125. And this is gross income from all adults in the household is what we look at for the map to see whether you're under the maximum. The application packet also has a little bit about the house, which we covered earlier, talking about its location right here on Pelham Road near the center, not too far from Amherst and the University of Massachusetts. If you're looking at Google Maps, the site can be found at 8 Amherst Road. Uh, it's not open to the public, but if you drive by, you'll see a chain link fence in front of what will be the future uh, house site. Uh, the construction team is still working on the construction documents, so I don't have more detailed renderings and floor plans to share right now. This is an early rendering that shows 
the two bedroom house with a shed behind it. And then in the distance, you can see the one bedroom, the one story house that will be built on the same piece of land. Even though it's these two houses are gonna be built on the same piece of land, that land is being divided into two separate building lots. So each house will have its own driveway and will be owned independently. There will not be a condo or homeowners association for anything other than maybe shared utilities, but they are single family houses on their own lots. So, um, and when I say shared utilities, I just mean that there'll be pipes and electricity run underground. And if someday you have to dig up the, that ground, you'll have permission from your neighbor to be able to dig in their ground. Uh, but no annual maintenance requirements that will be shared. So that gets us through the entire application packet. I'm gonna stop sharing and have us go back to um, talking for just a minute about how to submit your application documents. Lionel? All right, thank you, Megan. Um, how to submit your documents. Um, Pioneer Valley would like to do our best to make it easy to safely and securely submit your application documents. Due to COVID-19, our office is not open to the public. Uh, we want everyone to remain safe, uh, but we, so we've offered several options to submit your application on time. The first option that you have is that you can mail your paper application with copies of required documents. As long as your application is postmarked by the March 12th, 2021 deadline, it will be accepted. Uh, the address uh, to submit it, uh, your application to is Pioneer Valley Habitat for Humanity, PO Box 60642, Florence, Massachusetts 01062. Uh, the second option that you have is that you can drop off your paper application with copies of required documents and our lock mailbox at 140, that, that is 140 Pine Street, Florence, Mass, 01062. Look for the box labeled Pioneer Valley Habitat for Humanity on the middle floor near our office. There's a short set of stairs to access this box. And the third and final option is that you can uh, have a digital submission. Uh, you can request a secure link in advance of the deadline to submit your application or supporting documents electronically. A request form to get a secure link can be found at www.pvhabitat.org forward slash apply forward slash. Please do not email account numbers, social security numbers or other personal information uh, without first requesting this link. We are using two services for the security of your electronic documents. Uh, the first one is DocuSign uh, for filling out and signing your application. And we will post the uh, web address uh, shortly in the chat. And the second option is virtual for encrypting emails with personal information. You know, obviously we don't want you to uh, email or any uh, personal information because regular email obviously is not secure. Uh, a very important point is the application deadline. To be considered, you must submit your application on or before Friday, March 12, 2021. If you don't have everything ready by the deadline, uh, 
the application deadline is firm, but incom incomplete applications will be accepted. So, and, and also we don't encourage you not to wait until the last moment to submit your application in case there are some issues. So uh, you will receive, uh, submit what you can by the deadline to ensure your application is considered. Please try and submit as complete an application as possible to assist in a timely review process. If your application is incomplete, you will receive a notification, a follow-up notification requesting the missing information with a deadline for sending in the remaining items. It typically takes two to three months for the selection process to be completed after the application deadline. If you have any questions, you can call or email Megan. Uh, if you don't apply, you will not be selected. And the phone number, uh, the phone number is 413-517-8326. That is 413-517-8326. Or you can send an email to apply, all capital, at Pioneer PV Habitat, H-A-B-I-T-A-T dot O-R-G. And, and we will place that in this chat as well so you get the correct email address if you have any questions. And thank you and I'll turn it all back over to you. Thanks Lionel. I um, realized I didn't finish going through the selection process. Just um, after you submit the application as Lionel described, the Family Selection Committee reviews your application. The application reviewers look to see if your application is complete and review your credit history. After this initial review, applicants that do not meet Habitat selection criteria will receive a letter explaining why they have not been selected. Those that do meet the Habitat selection criteria will also receive a letter requesting additional information if necessary. It's very important to respond promptly to requests for additional information. Failure to meet deadlines for information can disqualify you from selection. After the application review is complete, there will be a virtual home visit. Any additional information that is gathered, the home visit is scheduled with two members of the Family Selection Committee. Before COVID, these home visits were done in person uh, with your whole family in the comfort of your home and it was an opportunity to ask those final questions one-on-one -on -one with someone before it moves on to the selection process. We are, unfortunately have to do this virtually now, but it's still a good opportunity to check in before you move forward. The meeting typically lasts about an hour. We may have some additional questions about your income or expenses. We ask that all members of your family that will live in the home, if you're selected, should be at the meeting. After the virtual home visit, the next step is the lottery and selection. The selection com committee will confirm which applicants have been determined eligible according to all the selection criteria. The selection committee then sends its recommended list of all eligible applicants to the Habitat Board of Directors for approval. The board confirms who will be in the lottery and a lottery is conducted. Once the lottery results are in, a member of the selection committee will contact the family to ask if they would like to partner with Habitat. If they say yes, we have our partner family and the real work begins. So thank you so much for your patient listening while we go through this process. And now I would like to um, be able to review any questions that people have. I'm gonna open up the um, Q&A here. I've answered some of the questions earlier um, by typing in the Q&A, but I see that there are some additional questions. Um, there are only two houses in this project. There are gonna be two three bedroom houses built right next door to each other, but on their own piece of land. One house will be a three bedroom 
and two stories, and one house will be three bedroom and one story. They both will have one and a half baths. Uh, there's also a question about resale and how that works, which is an excellent question. All of these, both of these houses will have a permanent deed restriction that limits the resale value, but it doesn't prevent you from selling. You can always sell your house and move if you're ready to move to a new location, if you decide that the place just isn't right for you, or if your family has gotten bigger or down, gotten smaller and you're ready to move somewhere else. You gain equity each time you make a mortgage payment, but that equity is limited by the maximum resale price of the house. There is a formula in the deed restriction that limits how much you can resell the, price, the house for. Because the maximum sale price of this house is $155,000, and the average house price in Pelham, I think, is somewhere around um, 275 or 300,000. If there wasn't any restriction, the sensible thing would be to sell it the day after you move in um, to be able to get all that equity immediately. But instead, we put a deed restriction so it'll be affordable for another family in the future. We want to make sure that all the investment of time and energy from the community that is put into the house is able to stay with the house. So if you bought your house for 155,000 and then the next year you wanted to sell, we would calculate based on the formula in your deed restriction, what the maximum resale price is gonna be. In no case would the maximum price be less than what you bought it for. Kathy, um, I know that there's a lot of question about unemployment right now because of COVID and um, for Pioneer Valley Habitat, um, we do not have a current written policy regarding COVID-19, but we're going to look at each application circumstances. But can you tell me a little bit what banks have been doing for underwriting with people who are um, experiencing temporary hardship due to COVID-19? Um, I'm putting you on the spot, sorry. Yeah, no, no, that's fine. Unfortunately, there's two different things here. So unfortunately, we can't count unemployment income unless it's seasonal unemployment. If, if somebody was a um, uh, landscaper and so every winter they collect unemployment, that's considered seasonal unemployment and that can be counted because we would ask for documentation on that. Um, but COVID-19, unfortunately, that unemployment, we cannot count that as income. Um, so that's, you know, and I, I, I know these loans are going to go through USDA. I'm not sure what their ruling is on it, but I have a feeling it's pretty similar. Um, but if it's seasonal unemployment and you can show a three-year history of it, that can be counted. And Kathy, um, would, is a gig worker, is that uh, related to seasonal unemployment? There's a question in the chat about that. I guess it would depend on what the gig is. You know, like what, if you can show a three year history of collecting unemployment, if it was something that just started now, even a landscaper who just started collecting unemployment, we wouldn't be able to count that because you have to have a three-year history of it. So if if somebody has that three-year history, that would work. Yeah, we definitely look at all sources of income. So, you know, if people are working part-time, if they have gigs, we will look at all those different sources of income. You don't have to have a single full-time job to uh, be considered. But when it gets down to the details of the, you know, exactly how it's calculated, it gets pretty particular to the individual situation. So we have to ask some follow-up questions often and look at that three-year history that Kathy's talking about. Uh, with people who have self-employment income that comes from different sources or gig work, that's where a history of income is really important for us to be able to document 
uh, whether it's likely to continue and be able to see what that average amount is. We also, you know, if you've changed jobs recently, but have a history of income in a similar industry, that also can count. So it's worth applying even if your situation is evolving. You know, if you are temporarily unemployed because of COVID-19, but you are able to return for, to work or, you know, there's gonna be continuation of income, uh, I would say that a temporary unemployment shouldn't deter you from applying. We, we can review that individual circumstance and look at uh, what your likeliness of the income continuing on into the future is. If you have a good history pre-COVID, that would, I think, allow us to be able to look at that full picture. So Megan, can I jump in here? I'm not Please. sure if this is, will help or, or uh, not sure if this would help or confuse people more, but we have had cases um, at the bank where there's been, the income has been reduced because of COVID and we work and qualify them on that reduced income. And if that works, great, because then once they get back to their full-time hours, it's only going to be them. So, if, if it's a reduction in pay because of COVID, we work with that reduced income and that if it, if it works, that's great. I think that's a really good point is um, you only have to meet the minimum to be eligible. So if you are going, if you're, even if your income's gone down recently, as long as you still meet that minimum, then you could be eligible. Yeah, and, and there is, um, uh, Kathy, what about the concept of a furlough? Um, I, I get, again, that's going to depend on how long the furlough is for, um, and it would probably mean that we wouldn't, uh, we definitely wouldn't close on anything. Although this, where this is a project here that's going to take some time, um, you wouldn't be able to close until you're back working. Um, but hopefully, within the terms of this, you know, twelve to eighteen months to get the house completed, you're back to work. So it's not going to affect you. Yeah, no, that's a good, really good point. Is that there is also a little different about habitat than buying a house that already exists is we still have to build these houses. So uh, we are looking to select uh, households for uh, these houses this spring. And then the construction process will start and about a year later will be when you actually close on the house. So there is a time frame in which um, you need to have maintain that minimum income. And if your income goes up, um, while in that time frame, while we're building that house, if it goes up a little bit, that's fine. It can go a little bit over our initial maximum income, but if it doubles or more, if it goes below, above 80% of the area median income, that could disqualify you. But that's would be if you double your income beyond the um, maximum or you know get significantly higher income hopefully that means other opportunities would open up for you as well to buy, purchase a house another way um, if you have um, a job loss while we're building the house um, you know if it's a temporary we give you some time to go out and look for work and return see if we can get things back on track if it's a um, more of a permanent situation, then that is one of the few reasons that you could be disqualified is if you no longer meet the minimum income uh, required. We also do look at um, disability income. So um, someone asked about uh, temporary loss of a job because of a, um, health reasons. 
it, the we would need if they're collecting disability or how you know that is also a source of income. Uh, it gets a. I would encourage people to um, submit their application if they are about to or have recently, you know, like someone about to return to work. The application deadline is March 12th. So if you can wait a few weeks and get your pay stubs from your first couple of weeks back to work, um, it's worth submitting those with your application. And I'm sorry, I don't have any great answers for the, these, all these questions about um, unemployment and furloughs due to COVID-19. I know this has been a pretty unusual year for a lot of people. Allison, I see that there is a question in the Q&A in Spanish. Um, I'm wondering if you can help maybe put it in the chat or if you can type answer or type it, that would be great. All right, uh, point it. Uh, all right, I'll, I'll write point it. So I see Allison pointing to something, and somehow I'm not seeing it. So let's see. Megan, she interpreted it. The question she wants to know the the question that was in Spanish is. You have to be a U.S. citizen. Great, thank you. Um, the you do not have to be a U.S. citizen. We need to know if you um, have the ability to work in the United States, so that we can verify your income. Um, for this project in particular, we're going to be asking you to apply for a loan from the USDA, which is a um, federal program with the United States. So they may ask for documentation of residency or citizenship. Um, Pioneer Valley Habitat for Humanity has a general um, no inquiry policy whenever it's um, not relevant to the lender. Um, there's a question about people who um, uh, don't live together right now. So one of the things that's a little bit different about Habitat versus a typical bank loan is we ask you if there's a co-applicant and that would be someone who is going to be a member of your household, someone who is going to live in the house with you. If that person is temporarily away, they could certainly join your household and be part of your application. But we don't take co-signers who are just people um, signing on to your application for to help support you financially. So a lot of times if you're buying some, getting out a loan from a bank, you can maybe ask um, a family member or a friend to be a co-signer and they are assisting you with their good credit or something like that. But a co-applicant is someone who intends to live in the house with you and tends to be a co-owner after you buy the house. So these have been good questions. Is there any I think that we may have made it through the questions in the Q&A. Is there anyone who needs to raise their hand because they were not able to type a question and needs to answer it verbally, needs to ask their question verbally? Okay, 
I see someone raising their hand. So I'm going to click, uh, to, I'm going to stop recording and then I'll, this session. Thank you everyone for being in attendance. And then I'm going to allow some um, verbal Q&A.